morning. I must have handed in my information to the bulletin wrong because it's the same sermon. I did not go through a theological crisis this week. I don't need a redo. <laughs> we are, in fact, moving on. Uh, so I'll ask you to turn uh, in Matthew 13. Today we're going to look at verses 31 through to 35. So once you're there, then I'll ask you to find that spot in your Bible and then to uh, stand as we read God's word together. And these are the perfect words of God. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. And may God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. I think I've shared the story of growing alfalfa this year. As a dairy farmer, we feed lots of alfalfa to our cows. And so this year I had to put some alfalfa seed in the ground to replace an older stand that we are taking out of production. If you've ever worked with alfalfa, you'll know that alfalfa seeds are very, very tiny. So tiny, in fact, that you don't put them in the ground to the moisture. You kind of put them on top of the ground and then kind of harrow it in, uh, and then you wait for rain or else they will not germinate. If you go too deep with those little seeds, they will not germinate. And as it happened this year, we broadcast our alfalfa on great conditions. I harrowed it. I rolled it. Man, we're off to a great start. And then, no rain, no rain, no rain, no rain. Landmark got rain, Mitchell got rain, we didn't. Uh, And it was very, very dry. And our alfalfa did not germinate. But you know what got a very good head start? Was every weed that has been on that field for the last 150 years did very, very well in that time. And then we have to start making a decision, okay? Do we wait for rain and wait for the stuff to germinate, or are the weeds going to snuff it out? And we rolled the dice and we said, we're going to cut those weeds. We're going to chop those weeds into poor silage that our beef farming neighbor can feed to his cows. And we're going to hope that that gives the alfalfa room to germinate. And you know what? We did it and it rained and the alfalfa started to come. But the weeds had such a head start uh, that the next cut uh, was some alfalfa and some weeds. And we cut it one more time. And you know what we ended this fall with? was a beautiful, thick, lush carpet of alfalfa that we hope to harvest next spring. But it did not look good for a long time there. And maybe if the dairy farming picture doesn't work for you, this is actually how it works with seeding your lawn as well, okay? Weeds don't like getting cut. The grass, the alfalfa, can handle it. And I want to suggest this morning, as we look at Jesus' kingdom parables, which are very agricultural, so it is with the kingdom of God in history. In Acts 14.22, it says that it is through many tribulations that we must enter the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is again in view in these parables, and we've seen Jesus already give a few, and he's going to give a few more as we go on, okay? And to define what is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is everywhere that Christ's rule and reign are present. So one way to say that is the kingdom of God is absolutely everywhere. There is not one corner of the cosmos where the kingdom of God is not. It's everywhere. But it's not seen, it's not visible, it's not acknowledged everywhere, And that is the job of evangelism, is to acknowledge it everywhere so that people can see the kingdom, not just live in it unknowingly. And so our work as people of God is to make this rule and reign of Christ obvious in our surroundings. It does already exist as an objective reality. This is God's creation, so of course he's ruler over it. But we want people to acknowledge that and to receive it gladly. And that is what the preaching of the gospel does. It opens eyes so that people can see that. The kingdom of God is spiritual in its origin, uh, and at the same time, we must resist the notion that uh, sees the kingdom of God as strictly spiritual, as though it doesn't really do stuff on earth. That is not uh, true either, okay? In this sense, the kingdom of God is very real-world stuff, and I think Jesus uses real-world kind of earthy pictures to help us understand. It is real. It gets into stuff, and that's what this parable says. Right? So some physical manifestations we see of God building his kingdom is it builds Christian marriages. 
Okay? When Christian young people get married, that is the kingdom of God being manifest through marriage. When they raise little children and disciple them in the things of the Lord, there's a physical manifestation with actual real-life human people where we can see this. When churches get planted, when empires and vain philosophies fall and people bend the knee to Christ, the kingdom of God is making a physical manifestation in this world. And in Jesus' first parable here, in verse 31 and 32, it says, He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but when it has grown, it is larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make their nests in the branches. Once in a former life, I was meeting actually with the moderator, the top preacher in a denomination I was once a part of, uh, and I was talking to him about a position that was clearly put out in her statement of faith uh, about biblical inerrancy. Uh, and I was quite surprised as a 20-something that he pushed back and said, well, no, the Bible is not inerrant. And he used this parable as an example of how it was not inerrant. Because there's actually smaller seeds we have discovered that are not mustard seeds. Jesus didn't get it right. Okay, go home. We don't have an inerrant Bible. What do we do now? But that's not how inerrancy works. Inerrancy allows that the Word of God uses uh, language in the ordinary sense that we all do, okay? If somebody asked me what time the sun set tonight, I would not be lying by giving them a time. But we all know in this room the sun will never set. <laughs> it's just staying there, and we're going to turn around so that we can't see it. it. In our world that we live in, in our experience, we use ordinary language, okay? If you're in Australia, does the rain fall? Well, yeah, you would talk that way, right? Because that's the way it appears to you. So if you ever hear this uh, used as an argument against inerrancy, I'd say don't, don't be too troubled by it. Jesus is using ordinary language. Of all the seeds that these people were using in their agriculture, the mustard seed was in fact the smallest seed in their possession. The point is, it's a very small seed. Christ is not saying he's unaware of other plants in his creation. He is talking to an actual audience of actual people engaged in actual farming in an actual culture. And yet that said, despite this mustard seed's small size, the mature plant grows up to 12 feet tall. And it gets sturdy enough that birds can build their nest in it. Okay? And so this is an unlikely parable to these original people. Because after all, who's really listening to Jesus at this point? He's already drawn the dividing line of using these parables. Most of the religious authorities, along with their followers, have already uh, decided to reject Christ, and he's left with a smaller and smaller band of people as it goes on. It's fitting that he starts with a mustard seed in this picture. What would seem really unlikely is that this little mustard seed, this little group of people that is following Jesus, would grow into this mighty tree. It seemed very odd, very difficult to believe, especially when you're watching Jerusalem reject her Messiah. But we have a picture of a small start and a glorious ending. So Jesus is not making modest claims here. But after telling us in the last parable that the field, that we looked at this last week, that the field in which the kingdom is planted is the whole world, he's now telling us about a tiny little seed that is growing up into a vast reality. And I think people often struggle to see uh, this when times are tough, as they are for many of us very often. We talked a l somewhat about this in Sunday school this morning. Uh, but given the secularization that's happened in our culture over the last hundred years or so, I am convinced that many Christians sincerely struggle to accept these kind of parables. It seems so unlikely. After all, all we have seen in our lifetimes is a, t is a period of difficulty, of the church compromising, of, of people leaving the faith. It, it doesn't look this way to our eyes in our experience, and I will happily grant it does not. But the way Christ speaks of the kingdom always involves growth and advance in history. And so I think we need to reckon with that when we think about uh, what we ought to do, what our marching orders are. And the fact is that Jesus always uses optimistic language and does not feature decline he does not instruct escape, but growth and victory. And this puts him right in line with the most unlikely of Old Testament prophets. Can, again, think of the, the big storyline of the Old Testament. God creates a physical world in which to be glorified, and he tells man to have what? Dominion. Have dominion over this. I'm deputizing you guys. Now you go have dominion for my glory. And sin interrupted this, of course, okay? But it didn't change God's design for what creation is for. It's still there to glorify him. The difference is now that glorification happens through Christ uh, and his grace rather than through Adam and his works.
But even there, in Genesis 3, when God promises enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, have you ever noticed this? The woman's seed is not in league with Satan against God. Okay? The fact that the woman and her seed are at enmity with the serpent means that the woman and her seed are to be known for being in league with God, not with Satan. And we have in God's covenant with Abram, it's promised that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through this old man who does not even yet have one child. Boy, that looks pretty unlikely, doesn't it? Here I am, you know, an old wrinkled up man, and all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed through a seed that isn't even born yet? That seems odd. That doesn't look feasible. Talk last week in Daniel 2, this image of this great statue representing the empires of the earth, and this uh, stone comes hurtling out of the sky and knocks this idol over in the days of the Romans, this mixed clay and uh, iron feet. How does the Gospel of Luke open? In the days of Caesar Augustus, the transitional king as Rome is moving from a republic to an empire. In the days of those kings, this rock comes hurtling out of the sky to smash the idols. Ezekiel 17 paints a picture very similar to Jesus here, where, uh, where there's a little sprig that's planted on a mountaintop, and the birds come from all over the world and nest in this place. And in his temple vision, vision in chapter 47, uh, there's this water, this living water that flows out from the temple. And he's told to go measure it several times. And first it's ankle deep, then it's knee deep. And the last time he goes to check, it's so vast, no one can swim through it. What's Ezekiel seeing? What's living water in the New Testament but the work of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit going out from God's mountain to the nations? And I want to suggest that Moses and Daniel and Ezekiel are not strange outliers in their vision for the world to be covered. A consistent prophetic hope all through the Old Testament, Habakkuk, Isaiah, and the psalmist all see it. And that is that the knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the deep. And so I think the Bible teaches a view of history in which the kingdom of God is moving out. It is doing its work. We talked a bit about this in Sunday school, so if there's questions about this, go back and listen to that or can... Uh, have a personal discussion too. Uh, but we're coming through several generations where the, the, the predominant view in the evangelical church has been uh, that the world is just overcoming the church, that the terrorists are overcoming the church. And that seems obvious to many of us, especially in a time where that is actually happening. But can we zoom out here bigger to what Jesus is, so, uh, is talking about? It may seem strange to us, but what do these parables mean? What does all this prophetic language mean? And I'm not so interested, we talk about the millennium, and I'm not so interested in that, uh, the exact sequence of events. Christians have always disagreed, and we do still. But with our vision of what is the kingdom doing in history. And I'm going to quote dead guys more often than I usually do. Uh, more just as a, I guess, it, to show that this is the predominant view. We have to get out of our own circumstances and see what have Christians in the past confessed. So I will confess that I'm going to read a little more dead guys verbatim than I usually do uh, to help show that this isn't a novel concept by any stretch. Uh, the great prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, who was technically premillennial in his theology but optimistic about the work of the kingdom, says this in his sermon titled Heaven and Hell. Some narrow-minded bigots think that heaven will be a very small place where there will be very few people who went to their own chapel or their own church. I confess I have no wish for a very small heaven. And I love to read in the scriptures where there are many mansions in my father's house. How often do I hear people say, Ah, straight is the gate and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. There will be very few in heaven. There will be most lost. My friend... I beg to differ from you. Well, I don't know if you're thinking, well, that's right in the Bible. Right? Spurgeon understood that to be the seed-like beginnings of the kingdom, not all history. Do you think that Christ will let the devil beat him? That he will let the devil have more in hell than there will be in heaven? No, it is impossible. For then Satan would laugh at Christ. There will be more in heaven than there are going to be among the lost. God says that there will be a number that no man can number who will be saved. But he never says there will be a number that no man can number that will be lost. There will be a host beyond all count who will get into heaven. What glad tidings for you and me. And this is where Spurgeon the Evangelist comes out. For if there are so many to be saved, why should I not be saved? If Christ is intent on saving so many, why not you? Why not this morning? Okay, come to Jesus now. Many will be saved. 
and he goes on. It says, it would be easy to show that our present rate of progress, the kingdoms of this world, could never become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Indeed, many in the church are giving up the very idea of it other than when they think about the return of Christ. And because this agrees with the spirit of idleness in our own day, it is likely to become a popular doctrine. I myself believe that King Jesus will reign and the idols be utterly abolished. But I expect the same power that turned the world upside down will once again do it. The Holy Ghost would never suffer the allegation to rest upon his holy name that he was unable to convert the world. The premillennial Charles Spurgeon speaking about the future of the kingdom. And this wasn't spoken by a man who was living in a dream world either. This is a man who suffered deep depression every day of his life, cried as he entered the pulpit 15 steps up and said to himself on each step, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Because Spurgeon did not believe in himself. And that's good. He suffered many insults. Much controversy. He was censured from his own denomination for insisting on things like the miracles of Christ and the substitutionary atonement and the inerrancy of Scripture. He was excommunicated from his own denomination for holding fast. So he was not seeing this in some Pollyanna kind of light. But he saw that the growth of the kingdom is consistent with the stated purposes of the king. This is his land, and he will yield the harvest that he desires on his terms. And so our job is to see our own calling in light of that. And so this optimistic and positive vision of the kingdom marching victoriously through history ought to fill us with both optimism and purpose, even when our present circumstances look like weeds all around. And even if the weeds are actually real, we ought to see through them to the promise. And sometimes our view of the future does become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? I used to work with a guy that was always obsessed with losing his job. And he started to interact with his employees like he was always going to lose his job. And then he started to get paranoid. And he started to not get along with people. And guess what happened? <laughs> he lost his job. <laughs> okay? I, I watched the Canucks and the Oilers the other night. One of those teams got on the ice knowing they were going to win. And the other team got on the ice like a bunch of losers and played like it. Guess what happened? <laughs> the winners won and the losers lost. Okay? To a degree, the way we think about our circumstances does become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And if we think of the idols in our own day, secularism, humanism, the sexual revolution, Islam, which is becoming very uh, ascendant, all of these rival views to Christianity have a very strong confidence in their own victory of the future. Right? What do you always hear if you're a conservative Christian? You're going to be on the wrong side of <laughs> history. Jesus says the only people on the wrong side of history are those whose knees he will have to break at the final judgment so that they will acknowledge his kingship. Okay? If you are a Christian, if you have peace with God, you cannot be on the wrong side of history. God's enemies are on the wrong side of history. You are not. And I think, because we've had a church, and I don't know what chicken and egg, we discussed that a bit too this morning in Sunday school. I honestly don't know uh, if the advance of the idols in recent history has caused the church to take a more defensive stance or if the church withdrawing has allowed the idols space, people will disagree on that. But I do think it's a feedback loop. Okay? As secularism makes more and more ambitious claims and we retreat, secularism is left to make more and more ambitious claims causing us to retreat. And I want to say let's start turning that in reverse in light of what scripture teaches. Because everyone seems to be getting what they're playing for. The winners seem to be winning, and the, those who think that they're promised to lose tend to be losing. But this has not always been the case. We haven't always seen it that way. Yes, we've seen decline in our lifetimes, and even the oldest people here will attest to the fact that things probably spiritually were much better when they were children than they are today. But how did that Christian culture get there? Think about that. How, how did that Christian culture get there? Did it just drop out of heaven and there was this mature Christian world in the year 200? No, it didn't happen that way. It hasn't just been nonstop decline. There has been growth. Somebody built that over the years of turmoil. That kingdom was built by actual Christians doing actual things. It's been slowly built up over time since the apostles. So if you zoom out all the way, how did you get from 11 guys that had no money, no Bibles, no churches, no sending agencies, no denominations, no missions groups, nothing. How did they get the kingdom out? That it's, there's churches and missions agencies on every continent on earth. 
And I don't for a minute believe that every person who professes Christ is a true Christian, nowhere close probably. But we live in a world where 40% of the people on earth say that they're Christian. Okay? If you're an early apostle, could you have pictured that happening? Probably not. Probably not. It would have looked unlikely. Or we look back sometimes at this golden age of Puritan England and Puritan New England. But you know what was going on a generation before the gospel enjoyed great and fast success? Is that in the city of London, fully 25% of the women were employed by prostitution. One generation before the Puritans. Okay? Is progress possible? <laughs> okay? A third of the brothels in London were dedicated to offering girls who were under the age of 14. Okay? This was a special service that they offered. Okay, people, this is one generation before the Puritans. <laughs> is victory possible? I want to say, yes, it is. That's not the only example by far. Within a few generations of the intense persecution of the early Christians by Nero and then Domitian, suddenly they're eating lobster and working out a Trinitarian document because the emperor says it's not good if you guys are disagreed on <laughs> the Trinity. Get together, figure this out. I'll feed you lobster. I'll give you safe housing. That happened within 200 years. It happened quick. So when we face the weeds in the world, in the church, or in our own lives, it's good to remind ourselves that victory is, in fact, not only possible, but it's promised. And this may be easier to understand when we scale it down to your own salvation. Maybe that's the best way to understand it. Christ saved you all at once. Okay? Christ's atonement is the decisive mark in history. But how does your sanctification look? Okay? There's an old gospel song, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Okay? And I get that. But is that true for every day? Or is that true over the long run? Is every single day better than the last one? I bet not. If you've got a child who's not walking with the Lord, I bet you every day doesn't seem like it's better than the one before. Okay? If you're losing a spouse to cancer, I bet you it doesn't feel like every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. But you know what? Age 80 is sweeter than age 20 if you're following with the Lord. We're promised that he who begins a good work in us will complete it. And so when we're fighting our own personal battle for holiness, we're fighting out of victory, not for it. And I think the same is true when we move into the general calling of Christians in the world. Christ's purpose is to overcome the world. In fact, he says he already did. Now you guys follow me. We're laboring on behalf of the one who has overcome the world. And he's promised that his word will bear fruit, that it will accomplish its work, and that the wheat field will be just fine until it's time to destroy the weeds once and for all. And we saw last week, what do the harvesters come to at harvest time? Okay, it's not a weed field with some wheat. It's a wheat field with weeds interspersed. Okay, the crop is doing just fine. Thank you. It will bear fruit. And so the mindset of expansion and victory that built the Christian order that we have largely enjoyed is the result of Christians who took this kingdom work on earth seriously. And I think that's what we need again today as always. Okay, and you see what happens even in the Old Testament accounts. Why is it that some people go to Canaan and all they see is giants in the land? What do some other people see? Oh, there's grapes and pomegranates. We just got to go get it. <laughs> Why do people see such different things? Who's looking with the eyes of faith? Ezra and Nehemiah had the vision to rebuild a temple from the ruins. And we need men today who can do the same thing with the Christian mindset that built this world that we have enjoyed. We're like the prodigal son, right? We're still enjoying dad's wealth. This generation, if you're my age, you are enjoying what previous people built, but the money will run out, <laughs> okay? okay? Just because you get an inheritance delivered on your lap, uh, yes, you'll be rich for weeks, but you know what? It's going to run out. Somebody has to keep investing or else it will be gone, and you will be left wondering what just happened with your head spinning. And so, yes, secularism, pluralism, humanism, the sexual revolution, Islam, you name it, it has done great damage, but even if we could turn it around today in this setting, we would still have much better field position than John Knox started with when he got to Scotland. Okay? We would have much better field position than St. Patrick started with in ancient Ireland. Because people still have the memory of Christianity largely. And so because this vision of Christ's kingdom has largely been set aside in the evangelical mindset for several generations, I do want to do a short survey over church history to see that this isn't it might seem new to us, but this is not at all new. This is how Christians have thought through the years. And I'll just give a sampling in the interest of time. 
the historian Philip Schaff talking about uh, summarizing the theology of the church father Oregon, Origen, pardon me, says that he expected that Christianity by continual growth would gain the dominion over the world. And then you have Athanasius, the man who defended the Trinity against great cost, where he says, since the Savior's advent in our midst, not only is idolatry no longer increasing, but it is getting less and gradually ceasing to be, while idolatry and everything else that opposes the Christian faith is daily dwindling and weakening and falling. See, the Savior's teaching is increasing everywhere. So also, now that the divine epiphany of the Word of God has taken place, the darkness of our idols prevails no more. And all parts of the world, in every direction, are enlightened by his teaching. This is a man who fought some very pitched battles, who sees that the idols must fall. Christ's kingdom must be victorious over history. Augustine, agreeing with those others, says that history will be marked by the ever-increasing influence of the church in overturning evil in the world before the Lord's return. Not after, before. This is how human history is going to go. The church is going to conquer through the preaching of the gospel. And Christ will return to a world filled with his saints. Moving ahead, Calvin in his commentary on the book of Micah. It says, Micah proclaims how all the world will be brought to God at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This reunification has already begun, is taking place now, and will continue until the end of the world. Jesus Christ has been designated the Lord, not simply of one corner of the world, but of all nations. Since our Lord Jesus Christ's kingdom has hardly begun, notice that, he's writing in the 1500s, he's saying this kingdom work has hardly begun. So Calvin looks at all the evil and all the decay in his world, and he's not saying, oh, it must be close to the end. He's saying all that corruption in the world must mean we're still at the beginning because there's lots of work to do. It's a different mindset. It is necessary for it to be implemented little by little until it achieves its full perfection. The Puritans overwhelmingly held this view. I won't even go into that, but this was uh, very much their view in building the West. But one more I want to probe into is William Carey. We all know this missions hero, William Carey, uh, considered the father of the modern missions movement who went to India. And he held to the same doctrine as his heroes in the faith and in missions, Jonathan Edwards, John Elliott, and David Brainerd. Uh, William Carey's most famous expression is, expect great things, attempt great things. Okay, maybe you've heard that expression. William Carey was not writing checks that his theology could not clear. He had a theology that made this possible. This is him. If the prophecies concerning the increase of Christ's kingdom be true, and if what has been advanced concerning the commission, the great commission, given by him to the disciples is is obligatory on us, and if it is just, it must be inferred that all Christians ought heartily to concur with God in promoting his glorious design. For he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Yea, a glorious door is opened and will be opened wider and wider by the spread of civil and religious liberty, accompanied also by a diminution of the spirit of the Catholic Church. A noble effort has been made to abolish the slave trade. And though at present it has not been successful, as successful as might be wished, yet it is hoped it will be preserved until it is accomplished. What's Kerry saying? He's saying that the Great Commission will be successful. Therefore, we need to start sending missionaries. We need to send them into hard places like Burma, like India, like China, like South America, like Africa. We need to go because the kingdom will be victorious. I'll mention one more. I won't have a quote here, but B.B. Warfield, a man who was one of the last conservatives to hold down at Princeton Seminary before Princeton Seminary turned liberal. This man fought battles about inerrancy, about the miracles, about all the same stuff that usually divides conservatives and liberals. His view of the kingdom expanse was so pervasive. I don't share this view, but just so you know, this is church history. Warfield's view that was by the time Christ returns, there would not be a single unbeliever left on planet earth. Every person would be converted before Christ Jesus returns. That's how he understood that all enemies must be put under his feet. I'm not quite that optimistic. But this is a view that has been held by very conservative men. But to summarize this, in his book, uh, The Rise of Puritanism by William Holler, he says that men who have assurance that they are to inherit heaven have a way of presently taking possession of the earth. They do things. And see, William Carey even uh, connected it to abolishing the slave trade. Okay? Today, we might say something like abortion. Can we conquer this beast? Okay? Can we slay that dragon? Is that in the church's future? It sure doesn't look possible. Can that idol, can that demon be killed? 
these men agree with what I think Christ is teaching and saying, yes, yes, that dragon can be killed. We can kill it. It might take a long time, but yes, it can be killed, and someone will be that victorious generation that will finally, once and for all, cut its head off. So when we read statements like Carrie's, which involve change in the actual world in which we live, we can transition easily into Jesus' second parable here. And this is where I think it becomes more pastoral. Verse 35, he says, He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a leaven that a woman took and hid in three measures of flour till it was all leavened. And again, we're dealing with a large-scale image here. Three measures is 50 pounds. Okay? So this is enough bread to feed a lot of people. And if the first parable that Jesus gives about the mustard seed is about how extensive the gospel is, okay, so my alfalfa field is corner to corner green, this next parable is how deep those roots go, how intensive the kingdom gets, okay? We're looking at extensiveness and also intensiveness. How powerful, how potent is it where it is? And the picture of the yeast isn't so much a picture of expansion as it is about a picture of it getting into everything, gets into everything. Matthew Henry, commenting on this passage, says it well. He says, the leaven thus hid in the dough works there. The leaven works speedily, and so does the word, and yet gradually. It works silently silently and insensibly, yet strong and irresistibly. Hide but the leaven in the dough, and all the world cannot hinder it from communicating its taste and relish to it, and yet none sees how it is done. But by degrees, the whole is leavened. Thus it was in the world. The apostles, by their preaching, hid a handful of leaven in the, great, in the great mass of humanity, and it had a strange effect. It put the whole world into ferment, and in a sense, turned the world upside down. It was thus effectual, not by outward force, and thereby not by any such force resistible and conquerable, but by the Spirit of the Lord of hosts, who works and none can hinder. See what he's saying here? This isn't going to spread top down. This isn't going to spread by the sword. This isn't going to spread by politics, but it's going to get into everything. It's going to get into everything, okay? And then he goes on and says that Christianity should be twisted in with national constitutions, that the kingdoms of the world should become Christ's kingdoms, and their heirs, the church's nursing fathers. Do your utmost, as the Great Commission says, to make the nations Christian nations. And I think this is the genius of how Christ establishes his gospel and his kingdom in the world. It does not come by top-down force. It does not spread by the sword, Uh, or by coercion, it spreads like leaven. It just organically keeps being contagious, and it keeps getting deeper into everything. It takes roots everywhere. The kingdom of Christ spreads through the preaching of the gospel, which is aimed directly at the heart of man. The gospel changes the heart, the heart changes the man, and the man changes his surroundings. That's how this works. It's organic. This isn't the 82nd Airborne. This is just organic life in a natural world. These parables are telling us that it is not only possible in small temporary pockets, but that this is how the future of the kingdom must progress. Sometimes in our day we speak of a post-Christian world, and this is true in that clearly the heart of the West is no longer Christian. We have largely gone after idols. But once the leaven is in the loaf, can you get it back out? Ladies, when you're baking bread, can you get the yeast back out? No, you can't. You can't. It's there for good now. Okay? There may be setback. There may be difficulty. But once it's in there, you cannot take it back out. Christianity, the gospel preaching of Jesus Christ, is a permanent feature of this creation since his advent. Okay? There's no taking it back out. It's there to stay. It's not going anywhere. So in that sense, there can never be a post-Christian world. It's impossible. Okay? It cannot happen. It's here for good. And so look at it this way. I think the, the arc of redemptive history can be summarized this way. God creates a physical cosmos in which he desires to be glorified. Through sin, man fell and this sin slowly creeps out everywhere. Sin is also called leaven in the Bible. It organically slowly spreads out and corrupts everything. But God is not interested in discarding his creation by uh, catastrophe, but in redeeming it. It says that Jesus Christ is reconciling all things to himself. His goal is still to be glorified in this creation. But what has changed through the fall and through the gospel is that, humanly speaking, this goal is now achieved through the gospel of Jesus Christ instead of through the works of Adam. 
And of course, from God's perspective, this was the plan all along. Nothing has changed from God's perspective. And the Bible promises that there will be suffering and setback all the way through. Suffering is promised. The tares being there all the way through is promised. But the advance is equally promised. And I think this is an important distinction we can make when we think about, okay, the gospel changes the heart, the heart changes the man, the man changes his surroundings. If we're engaged in changing our surroundings just at the level of culture wars, just fighting symptoms, we're going to see no success because that's not resting in the root issue here, which is the heart of man, which must be transformed by the gospel of Christ. Politics is downstream from culture. And do you know what culture is? I'll give you a real simple definition. You know what culture is? It is the heart religion of a people externalized. Okay? Every culture. If you want to know what a people believe, observe their customs. <laughs> you will soon find out what the heart religion of those people is. Okay? So culture is not bad. It's not good. It's just it's a reflection of the heart religion of the people. Okay? So the way people think produces a culture, and downstream from that culture are political expectations. Okay? Politicians only promise what people want. <laughs> okay? They're not promising things we don't want. So this has to start at the top and work its way down. This cannot be top, well, cannot be authoritarian in that sense. So if we want to make lasting changes in the political realm, the culture must be teaching us what is good and true and beautiful. And for the culture to do that, that means it has to be in the heart of men. So this still comes back to the preaching of conversion, the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of repentance and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because none of this is happening by our efforts, and yet our efforts must be consistent with God's global design. The gospel changes the heart, the heart changes the man, the man changes his surroundings. And then Jesus closes and says, All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Okay? And so we looked at this when Jesus started speaking in parables. And he says that the point of these parables is to serve as a dividing line for those who can see what these parables mean and those who are stuck in their darkness, in their unbelief. Okay? Here it says that this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. Well, which prophet? Where? Well, the psalmist in Psalm 78, 2. He says, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. And then if you read that psalm, and I'd encourage you to read it this week, because it's actually quite encouraging. The rest of the psalm is just a long history of Israel. I did this for you guys, and you returned it with idolatry. And then I opened the waters for you, and then you rose up and started to drink and have sex and start dancing. And then I did this for you, and then you people forgot. And then I did this for you, and you people forgot. And then I did this for you, and you people served idols. Are we really any different? (laughs) How much has God done for you? And how quickly do we go serve the idols that overpromise and underdeliver? The psalmist gives a history of the people of God in Israel. It's an entire summary of redemptive history. And one of the benefits that I find in getting older is that there are so many more instances in my own life that I can look back on and see how God has been faithful. Okay, so many times, especially when you're young, how is this going to work? How is this going to work? How am I going to meet my wife? How am I ever going to start farming? How am I going to, right? And these things all seem insurmountable. But as you get older, you can, God provided there. God provided there. He provided there. He's going to do it again. Okay? okay? Remembering the history of yourself and of your people is a great encouragement. So how are we looking ahead? Are we looking with the eyes of faith like Abram, childless, but promised to bless the nations through his seed? Or are we looking at it just through the eyes of chance and probability? Can we trust what Jesus says about the victory of his kingdom in history? Can we press ahead with the mindset of victory that has been promised? And I want to say, look at what has been brought upon the people of God, both in the Bible and then afterward through history, when we don't see these promises, when we're tempted to retreat, when we're tempted to say we can't get ahead. The idols are too big to smash. Okay? Are they too big to smash or are they too big to miss? How did David see Goliath? A forehead that size? Well, this guy's going to go down easy. (laughs) That's that's how you look with the eyes of faith. Okay? The idols are not too big to fight. They're too big to miss. Okay? And we have a bunch of idols that are toppling, and they cannot sustain themselves in our own time. 
all it's going to take is a few people with a bit of courage to say, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And guess what happens? You discover those idols are impotent. Okay? And once one person can start laughing at it, a bunch of other people are going to find some courage, and they're going to be able to start laughing at it too. And guess what? Idols don't like being laughed at. They will go away. They will be removed in due time. My alfalfa was harmed each time I cut it. It was stressful. Down to the crown, it has to regrow. But each time I cut it, yes, the alfalfa was stressed, but guess what? The weeds were killed. When God shakes things, Hebrews talks about the shaking. When God unsettles his people, it does unsettle them, but it removes his enemies so that only that which cannot be shaken, that's you and me in this room. Okay, that is the Christian church. He shakes things so that that which cannot be shaken, right here, will be left standing in the end. God removes his enemies so that we keep pressing on. And I want to make specific application This church and some of our churches in our network, I would be lying if I said I don't think there is a spiritual conflict happening. I have heard things about myself. I have heard things about people in this room. And I have heard from other pastors who have been slandered and who have been dealt very difficult circumstances in their church, not always slander. Okay? It seems like something is happening. People are telling lies. Uh, in the span of one month, I had one person tell me, well, if you guys are going to keep preaching that free grace, that means there's no room for law. And frankly, uh, I, need the, I need the threat that my salvation could be lost at any minute for me to keep persevering. And then he turned around and said, you guys are too legalistic. You've got too many rules. <laughs> okay? If you, can, if you can lose your justification by not keeping the rules, how many rules do you have to keep to keep your justification? Who's got the rules, okay? So the, the, some of these things don't even make sense. They're talking about both sides of their mouth. You guys are too much grace, also you're too, too legalistic, okay? Some of the pastor friends I have have been dealt bitter blows within their family. And it seems like it's not just normal. It seems difficult. And I've talked to many people here. Many of you are dealing with some very difficult things. Are you looking with the eyes of faith? Okay. Can the idols be chopped down? Can your children return to the Lord? Will Jesus build his church? Yes, 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 and yes. We need the eyes of faith. And when people slander, when people tell you that the elders in this church are no darn good, they're right. Okay. I'll own it. I'll be like Martin Luther. Yeah, we're no good. Okay. But what are we pointing to? We're not pointing to... Us, we're not pointing to infallible people. We're looking at the word of God. Okay? These slanders, these difficult situations, these unbelieving children, stressed marriages, financial difficulties, all this stuff that I've been hearing about that um, sometimes seems overwhelming when I pray for you people. This is what we need to see. The kingdom of God gets into everything and it will be victorious. And when people slander and when people say poor things or they misrepresent, I just think, you know what, if we're in a war, and I think, there's imagery for that in the Bible. If you're flying a fighter jet and you start taking flack, it probably means you're over a strategic target. <laughs> okay? People that are making no difference in the kingdom don't get opposition. I would say this is good. Jesus says it's good when people speak poorly of you. Okay? And we are competing as Christians against so many idolatrous and bad and corrupt ideas in the world, and young people especially, who are forging the path ahead are hearing all kinds of competing ideas about what will bring you glory, what will make you happy, okay? There's one way to stay on a horse and many ways to fall off. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ will bring you joy. And when people tell you not to take the Bible so seriously, not to take your church life so seriously, not to take your Bible reading so seriously, because after all, <laughs> if you're doing that, always ask, hey, what, what is the authority being appealed to? By what standard? Always ask that question. Are people, when they're giving competing ideas, are they helping you get deeper into the word of God? Helping you understand it better? Or are they taking pot shots at the side? Okay, and when people criticize Christianity, when people criticize the gospel, okay, and especially in this day and age where conservative theology is not universally received, okay, to some degree it's just the spirit of vandalism. I can't paint a better picture. I can't 
You know, I can't have what you have. Uh, I'm not willing to do the work on my marriage. I'm not willing to take my spiritual life more seriously. And misery loves company. So rather than striving, what do they do? Misery loves company. I'll pull everyone down with me. I want everyone living down in my little pit with me. You know why? Because I feel better about myself when there's other people who I'm influencing to not take their spiritual life seriously. Okay? It's a lie. It's a lie from the pit. By what standard? How do you know what you know? How are you going to live your life? Is this the word of God? Okay? Can the idols be decapitated? Yes. Get out there and do it. And yes, this church and other churches and everyone here is all imperfect. But then I will go with what the evangelist D.L. Moody said when he faced criticism for his work. He said, well, frankly, I prefer my way of doing it imperfectly to your way of not doing it at all. Okay? Can we agree with Dr. Moody? Okay? I prefer my way of doing it imperfectly than you not even getting started. And at root of all of this is human autonomy. It's the first sin of our parents. They answered the by what standard question, well, it's my opinion. In my opinion, in my experience, this is, you know, this is what I think will bring me happy. That's the problem, not the way out. Human autonomy is the corruption, not the way out. God has shown us his mind in his word. And this means that absolutely everything must conform to the standard of scripture. Everything. When you are presented with ideas at university, students, by what standard? How do you know what you know? By what standard? Show me your work. By what standard? Never tire of asking that question. How do you know what you know? How will you test it? We are Christians. By this standard. Okay? By this standard and none other. By this standard. So our task is always to get back into the word. And we are seeing in our time the fruit of compromised Christianity. Has anyone noticed? Everyone's either finding their way back to the ancient paths, to full rock rib Christianity, or they're deconstructing and leaving the faith altogether. Has anyone else noticed that? Okay. The instability of the 1980s and 1990s and the 2000s is working itself out. People are finding the ancient paths, which is what we are trying imperfectly to offer, or they're just leaving the faith. Okay, and the whole Christian deconstructionism thing, the whole progressive Christianity, all you're doing is waiting five years before you tell everyone, yeah, I just hate God. Skip the step. Save yourself some time. If you're thinking about deconstructive, if you're going to try progressive Christianity, just leave. Okay? No one's forcing you to be a Christian. It's instable. Just realize what's at stake here. It is going to be Christ or it is going to be chaos. And there is no mediating position. Okay? Either the leaven gets all the way in you are fully sold out to Jesus Christ, or please leave. Okay? Don't lie. The leaven has to get into everything. Are we willing to think that way? People, are we willing to think this way? <laughs> does the leaven need to get into everything? Yes, it does. It must get into everything. We must find the ancient paths. We must say, by this standard. Okay? The idols can be toppled in your life and in the world. Now let's get to it. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the pictures that you use to describe the work of your kingdom, not just in the world as the gospel goes out to the nations and converts people, but also of the way that it digs its roots into our souls. Lord, and we are a people who are already here. We have heard your gospel. We want to trust that each one here is converted, and yet, Lord, there may be some who are not. Lord, I pray that right now you would convert their hearts. Drop the scales from the eyes. Unstuff their ears. Lord, work. You've promised to do it, so do it, please. Now. And then, Lord, I pray that we would not be happy with mere conversion, but that the leaven would get into everything. Lord, I pray for a church, for young people, for children, for old people, to see the leaven work its way into everything that our theology wouldn't just stay in our head to play games, but that it would come out our fingertips through graciousness, through confidence, through fruitfulness, through productivity, through spending our time on worthwhile endeavors instead of a bunch of fake, flimsy promises. Lord, you've done it again, and we are pleading with you, do it again now. You have been good in history. Do it again. We pray this all in the strong name of Jesus. And amen.
Please stand as we sing. I learned this morning that if you're under 40, you probably won't know this song. So if you're over 40, you have to sing doubly loud. <laughs> Today's charge is from a dead guy who has moved on to victory, J. Gresham Machen. The Christian cannot be satisfied so long as any human activity is either opposed to Christianity or out of all connection with Christianity. Christianity must pervade not merely all nations, but also all of human thought. The Christian cannot, therefore, be indifferent to any branch of earnest human endeavor. It must all be brought into some relation to the gospel. It must be studied either in order to be demonstrated false or else in order to be made useful to the kingdom. The kingdom must be advanced not merely extensively but also intensively. The church must not only seek to conquer every man for Christ but also the whole of each man. And I will leave you with the benediction from 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now go and take those thoughts captive and go in peace. Mm -hmm. 